Being on TV made me extremely aware that people are always watching you, that you're a role model, that you're an example, that your actions matter, they affect other people. Welcome to Crazy Good Turns. I'm your host, Frank Blake. This is a podcast where we recognize and celebrate people who do crazy good things for others. And in this episode, it's a real privilege to welcome author and national television personality, Adrian Banker. You probably know Adrian from her appearances on Good Morning America. And she's also the author of a new book titled Your Hidden Superpower, The Kindness That Makes You Unbeatable at Work and Connects You with Anyone. I think the book is, is a pretty remarkable meditation on kindness, how to live it, and how doing so not only leads to greater happiness, but it can also help empower you. I also am going to be very interested in talking with Adrian because honestly, if you ask for an industry that does not come to mind, does not come to mind as particularly kind, kind of a dog-eat-dog, claw-your-way-up industry. It's broadcasting, TV broadcasting particularly, so it's going to be really interesting to get, you know, how Adrian got to write this book and see the power of kindness. So with that, we'll just jump right into the conversation and welcome Adrian. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Frank. You have such a relaxing voice. I just want to like sit here and listen. Just, I'll let you talk the whole time. <laughs> First off, I want to start with the book. And it's a really interesting title. Kindness is an interesting word itself, but it's interesting to think about it as a superpower and interesting to think about it as a hidden superpower. First, describe the superpower part of it. Well, for me, I saw people relegating kindness to this basic politeness. And in business, as you well know, a kindness is remembered and a kindness helps to make some of these deals happen. You know, we, we focus a lot in business, I think, on the hardships and the industry insider information that you need and the fact that you have to be so ambitious and all of those things are relevant. But what, what I've seen, because I talk to people in so many different walks of life and different businesses as a journalist, that kindness is one of the tools in the tool belt, so to speak, for so many successful presidents and CEOs and influencers. And I myself made this intentional decision to be kind because of the stress level of the industry I was in. And seeing that if you were in a high stress position, somebody being kind to you could actually give you that rocket fuel to keep going when you did want to hit the wall or when you did have an altercation or when things were just hard, you know, getting on television with all the deadlines and all of the short turnaround and it, it can be just taxing. So I thought, you know what, my first job in broadcasting is not to get the words out of my mouth right. My first job in broadcasting is to bring a sense of calm and to be able to work with people so they feel supported. Because if you respect your crew, I write a whole chapter on that in the book on, on kindness to your crew, then they're going to have your back. And, and there's no better feeling than having people have your back. When was the first time you realized this, that it's a superpower? Well, it was interesting. I didn't know that I would have called it a superpower back when I realized it. I think I just realized that it was something I couldn't go without. It was non-negotiable. I'm the oldest of seven kids. My mom's one of nine children. So you have a lot of personalities. <laughs> and when you're the oldest, you have this kind of very strong, I'm a leader. Well, I got into the business and I was often the youngest or one of the younger people. I found out very early on I could not use my leadership skills as my strength at work because I was going to get told, little girl, sit down. You know? <laughs> with the bosses and with the people who were veterans in the industry and with people more experienced than me. And so I quickly learned to adapt from being the oldest, which I had a lot of experience in as a young person, to somebody who was the youngest. And I actually studied my siblings to get personality traits 
so that I was more endearing. I wasn't faking it. It was just, let me treat this person like a big sister or a big brother so that they know that I'm not too big for my britches, so to speak. It wasn't me kissing up. It wasn't me trying to please people. It was literally like, what do you need to do to be successful in this communication? And then the second part was when a coworker snapped at me and I wanted to snap back. And it was over something small. It was, a, it was so small. But he was, he was behind the scenes. I was on camera. And he got mad at me. And I thought, what in the world? And I wanted to say something, but I didn't. And I found out the next day his mom had died. And when I found that out and I didn't respond, I said, I will never, ever judge somebody for losing their temper because I don't know what's really going on inside of them that has nothing to do with me. It was my mentor, Bill, who was like, "Um, you should write a book on kindness, you know, all these years later, because I had really worked kindness as a muscle in these high pressure situations. And he could see that I had developed something, but I didn't really know the fullness of it until I started writing it down. So I'm grateful that I listened because now we have the book. Because I would have written a biography and I'm too, I haven't lived enough life to do that. Yeah. (laughs) And the other phrase, hidden. Why hidden? How do you observe it? Kindness as being a hidden superpower. Because people think it's weakness a lot of times. People really don't know. It's like when you're 16 and you say, I love you to your girlfriend and you think you know what you're talking about. You know, when you're 16, it's a feeling. But when you're married for 20 years, and this is by my examination, when somebody's married for that long and committed that long or, you know, decides to, you know, make choices based on love and not their intellect, um, that's a choosing that requires you to override your feeling. And with kindness, I think there are a lot of nice people, but they're not necessarily kind people. I think they can smile on your face and make, make you think everything's fine, but inside they're raging. And I think that a lot of times our hidden feelings about things can actually be the real motivation. A lot of people in business are motivated by pain. You know, they're motivated by what went wrong, by what they had to go through. And that helps develop their protocol. That helps develop their policy. That's how they deal with people is what they got hurt by in the last deal. It, you know, it's not about KPI. It's about who kicked my butt, you know, or whatever. So I just, um, I think that kindness is hidden because you think you know what being kind means, but radically changing your perception from kindness as a feeling, I feel like being sweet to somebody, or kindness as a choosing. Um, I'm going to choose who I'm kind to. I'll be kind to people who are like me. I'll be kind to people who think like me. I'll be kind to the needy, but everybody else I I don't even have time for. With the hidden part, I wanted people to realize it's actually who you are. It's in your DNA. You can't see your chromosomes, but they're in there. And if we saw each other as kind, as identity, then our knee-jerk response to hardship, to problems, would actually be more compassionate. And that's why I called it hidden. That's so interesting. And then difference between being, you know, kindness and niceness, I think, and politeness is important. It seems like you might interact with a lot of people who kind of pretend to be kind. And maybe this is just a uh, gross generalization of, you know, the, your industry broadly phrased has a lot of people who pretend, no? I I think a lot of people in every industry pretend. (laughs) Yeah, true, true. It gathers a lot more headlines. Right. (laughs) Well, you don't have a camera on you, whereas I think you should always act like you do. You know, I, I talk about in the book about having a hot mic on all the time because I think one of the greatest gifts to my life, it's not that I got to be on TV. It's that being on TV made me extremely aware that people are always watching you, that you're a role model, that you're an example. Being on TV made me extremely aware that people are always watching you, that you're a role model, that you're an example, that your actions matter, they affect other people. Welcome to Crazy Good Turns. I'm your host, Frank Blake. This is a podcast where we recognize and celebrate people who do crazy good things for others. And in this episode, it's a real privilege to welcome author and national television personality, Adrian Banker. 
You probably know Adrian from her appearances on Good Morning America, and she's also the author of a new book titled Your Hidden Superpower, The Kindness That Makes You Unbeatable at Work and Connects You with Anyone. I think the book is is a pretty remarkable meditation on kindness, how to live it, and how doing so not only leads to greater happiness, but it can also help empower you. I also am going to be very interested in talking with Adrian because honestly, if you ask for an industry that does not come to mind, does not come to mind as particularly kind, kind of a dog-eat-dog, claw-your-way-up industry. It's broadcasting, TV broadcasting particularly, so it's going to be really interesting to get, you know, how Adrian got to write this book and see the power of kindness. So with that, we'll just jump right into the conversation and welcome, Adrian. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Frank. You have such a relaxing voice. I just want to, like, sit here and listen. Just, I'll let you talk the whole time. (laughs) First off, I want to start with the book, And it's a really interesting title. Kindness is an interesting word itself, but it's interesting to think about it as a superpower and interesting to think about it as a hidden superpower. First, describe the superpower part of it. Well, for me, I saw people relegating kindness to this basic politeness. And in business, as you well know, a kindness is remembered and a kindness helps to make some of these deals happen. You know, we, we focus a lot in business, I think, on the hardships and the industry insider information that you need and the fact that you have to be so ambitious and all of those things are relevant. But what, what I've seen, because I talk to people in so many different walks of life and different businesses as a journalist, that kindness is one of the tools in the tool belt, so to speak, for so many successful presidents and CEOs and influencers. And I myself made this intentional decision to be kind because of the stress level of the industry I was in. And seeing that if you were in a high stress position, somebody being kind to you could actually give you that rocket fuel to keep going when you did want to hit the wall or when you did have an altercation or when things were just hard, you know, getting on television with all the deadlines and all of the short turnaround and it it can be just taxing. So I thought, you know what, my first job in broadcasting is not to get the words out of my mouth right. My first job in broadcasting is to bring a sense of calm and to be able to work with people so they feel supported. Because if you respect your crew, I write a whole chapter on that in the book on on kindness to your crew, then they're going to have your back. And and there's no better feeling than having people have your back. When was the first time you realized this, that it's a superpower? Well, it was interesting. I didn't know that I would have called it a superpower back when I realized it. I think I just realized that it was something I couldn't go without. It was non-negotiable. I'm the oldest of seven kids. My mom's one of nine children. So you have a lot of personalities. (laughs) And when you're the oldest, you have this kind of very strong, I'm a leader. Well, I got into the business and I was often the youngest or one of the younger people. I found out very early on I could not use my leadership skills as my strength at work because I was going to get told, little girl, sit down, you know? with the bosses and with the people who were veterans in the industry and with people more experienced than me. And so I quickly learned to adapt from being the oldest, which I had a lot of experience in as a young person, to somebody who was the youngest. And I actually studied my siblings to get personality traits so that I was more endearing. I wasn't faking it. It was just, let me treat this person like a big sister or a big brother so that they know that I'm not too big for my britches, so to speak. It wasn't me kissing up. It wasn't me trying to please people. It was literally like, what do you need to do to be successful in this communication? And then the second part was when a coworker snapped at me and I wanted to snap back. And it was over something small. It was was so small. 
But he was he was behind the scenes. I was on camera. And he got mad at me. And I thought, what in the world? And I wanted to say something, but I didn't. And I found out the next day his mom had died. And when I found that out and I didn't respond, I said, I will never, ever judge somebody for losing their temper because I don't know what's really going on inside of them that has nothing to do with me. It was my mentor, Bill, who was like, um, you should write a book on kindness, you know, all these years later, because I had really worked kindness as a muscle in these high pressure situations. And he could see that I had developed something, but I didn't really know the fullness of it until I started writing it down. So I'm grateful that I listened because now we have the book. Because I would have written a biography and I'm too, I haven't lived enough life to do that. Yeah. (laughs) And the other phrase, hidden. Why hidden? How do you observe it? Kindness as being a hidden superpower. Because people think it's weakness a lot of times. People really don't know. It's like when you're 16 and you say, I love you to your girlfriend and you think you know what you're talking about. You know, when you're 16, it's a feeling. But when you're married for 20 years, and this is by my examination, when somebody's married for that long and committed that long or, you know, decides to, you know, make choices based on love and not their intellect, um, that's a choosing that requires you to override your feeling. And with kindness, I think there are a lot of nice people, but they're not necessarily kind people. I think they can smile on your face and make make you think everything's fine, but inside they're raging. And I think that a lot of times our hidden feelings about things can actually be the real motivation. A lot of people in business are motivated by pain. You know, they're motivated by what went wrong, by what they had to go through. And that helps develop their protocol. That helps develop their policy. That's how they deal with people is what they got hurt by in the last deal. You know, it's not about KPI. It's about who kicks my butt, you know, or whatever. So I just, um, I think that kindness is hidden because you think you know what being kind means, but radically changing your perception from kindness as a feeling, I feel like being sweet to somebody, or kindness as a choosing. Um, I'm going to choose who I'm kind to. I'll be kind to people who are like me. I'll be kind to people who think like me. I'll be kind to the needy, but everybody else I I don't even have time for. With the hidden part, I wanted people to realize it's actually who you are. It's in your DNA. You can't see your chromosomes, but they're in there. And if we saw each other as kind, as identity, then our knee-jerk response to hardship, to problems, would actually be more compassionate. And that's why I called it hidden. That's so interesting. And then difference between being, you know, kindness and niceness, I think, and politeness is important. It seems like you might interact with a lot of people who kind of pretend to be kind. And maybe this is just a uh, gross generalization of, you know, the your industry broadly phrased has a lot of people who pretend, no? I, I think a lot of people in every industry pretend. <laughs> Yeah, true, true. It gathers a lot more headlines. Right. (laughs) Well, you don't have a camera on you, whereas I think you should always act like you do. You know, I, I talk about in the book about having a hot mic on all the time because I think one of the greatest gifts to my life, it's not that I got to be on TV. It's that being on TV made me extremely aware that people are always watching you that you're a role model, that you're an example, that your actions matter, they affect other people. I think if every CEO in America did a reality show for three months, they would adjust some things in their life. And not that there's anything that they have to hide or that's wrong in their life. I think that it would heighten their accountability. I think that they would choose different words in meetings Because one of the the things that I hope with this book is that it helps business people, but it helps all people to realize their value and that the words and the actions they take matter so much, even when it seems like they're doing it behind closed doors, even when it seems like, oh, you know, I'm just talking to these three people. And we know that logically here, but being on TV for so many years has really hit, it's hit me here. Because when I was a little kid, my mom would say, somebody's always watching you, little girl, you know, somebody's always watching you, Adrian, even if you can't see them. But it made me aware of the audience. And in social media terms, you know, you think about everybody who is invisible but sees us. 
online, on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, whatever we're using, and Twitter. And uh, they're watching our moves. They're watching the words we choose. They're watching to see if they can read between the lines. And that gives us a freedom to express ourselves authentically. And yet kindness is the filter that keeps us safe. I think it's an insurance policy. I think it's smart business to run everything through a kindness filter and say, is what I'm about to post kind? What did you learn from kindness as you wrote your book? I mean, that's a tough topic, to, I would think. Now, why do you call it tough? Can I ask you a question? Because uh, just as you said, there are so many aspects to it. There is a blurring of the lines between kindness and politeness and niceness. And there's a lot of, I think, potential misunderstanding about what it means. Yeah, you're 100% right. What I learned about kindness through writing the book was during the most difficult times of my life, it was kindness that anchored me. You know, I thought that kindness was for the purpose of making me a better person and being a good human, which it is. But I went through some very stressful times. I write about in the book about um, the death of my birth father and the stress that it caused on me. And that when I was being kind, I actually was keeping this rhythm so that I didn't sink, so that I didn't fall into a a serious state of affairs, you know, more um, sorrow or grieving um, than could help me function in the moment. That was done through scheduling kind acts and kindness that was already instituted in my life. So I was having weekly, and I still do have weekly mentoring calls, And I was going there, even though I was grieving, but it was this rhythm so that I wouldn't lose step with my job. I talked about when negotiations fell through in my life, you know, endeavoring to be, you know, this phenomenon and we're going to charge ahead and we're going to know our value and we're going to do big things and seize the day and then things collapse. And so what do you do? And Being able to be kind and not have a chip on your shoulder with the same people, being able to be kind when you have conversations with people in the business and not act like, you know, I'm fine. I'm and defending yourself and protecting yourself actually served me rapidly where results came because I was going to be who I said I was. Again, kindness as an identity versus kindness as a act. You know, I am I can do all the right things, but it doesn't make me kind. When I determine I'm going to be kind, even when my circumstances and life is unkind to me, that is when our true strength is shown. And the fact that kindness had opened doors before, I knew that it would open doors again. I just had to stick it out a little longer. So you talk about kindness as creating a resiliency. Is there ever also a point where you walk away from kindness, where you just say, this is too much, I can't be kind, I can't be that person? I think that is a great question. And I think the answer is no, because one thing I write about in the book uh, is that kindness does not lay down on the floor and act as a doormat. And I'm sure, Frank, just knowing a little bit about you, that you've mentored people and sometimes had to say something that someone didn't want to hear. And it could be considered unkind to say things like, you know what, you got stuff all over your face. And if you'd look in the mirror, you'd know that can come off as unkind. So I, what my, my answer to you would be is, no, it's never right to walk away in terms of to say, I'm not going to be kind to you. But unfortunately, because kindness is so hidden in a lot of ways for people, it will be perceived as less than kind when in reality it's doing that person or that entity a favor. That's a really profound answer. You also say, and you talk about kindness as an exercise. I mean, think about kindness as you think about a fitness plan. How does that work? (laughs) Well, it's funny because I I really wasn't, it's not my favorite thing to do to work out, but it's a great analogy. I started working out again in this pandemic with a virtual personal trainer who's located in Atlanta, so I'm happy about that. But um, (laughs) when I... um, When I thought about people who are addicted to working out, I thought they exercise no matter what. They go out and it's part of their routine and they have the best result. They have the best figure. They have the best meal plans. They have the best abs. And I thought we all have a human body, 
but we decide how much we're going to work it out and get benefit from it, whether we are a, you know, a cyclist or a boxer or a dancer, then that means I can take kindness as my inherent body of work, right, or power. And just like that athlete, I can work it out. And that would require a consistent routine. A lot of people are fans of random acts of kindness, which I think are great, but it's like hitting the lottery. You don't know. It's a surprise. It kind of comes out of nowhere. It's like, oh my gosh, that was so sweet. But when somebody is kind consistently by, I've I've told people who are very socially averse or who have a problem with being sensitive to others, on that spreadsheet, on that daily log, on your calendar, mark it when you will be kind. For anybody, whether you think you're kind or not, it cannot hurt to schedule kindness calls. I was just talking to uh, somebody yesterday on an Instagram Live, and he calls somebody, he calls three people every day. And it's, it, it becomes a muscle just because, just to show appreciation, to show appreciation, to buy somebody virtual coffee because you can't be in the city with them and take them out right now, or buy somebody virtual lunch or dinner and just make a deposit into their account or their Venmo or send them a gift card. That actually starts to keep you more aware of other people. And to call a colleague or somebody who you're doing business with without any expectation of return will actually affect you in spades later. You don't realize what you're nurturing. And just that muscle of being situationally aware. I like to say that kindness is using your conscience for other people's benefit because a lot of people have a problem with hearing that little voice inside. They don't know when it's right to make a move or to say yes or no to a deal. But I said, so the best way is to use your conscience for someone else because then you end up actually becoming more intuitive for your own life. And again, that's the fitness plan of it. So this sounds so wise and so (laughs) well thought through. Was this, you already had this in mind as you sat down to write? Or how do you you get to these conclusions? I lived it. You know, it's... um, a lot. I, I have to attribute a lot to my mentor who said to write the book. I remember when I'd had uh, an issue with a photographer. I told him what happened. I don't remember if he did it right away, but he said he own, he has a nonprofit. And he said, you're going to be the best photographer I have. You're going to be the best editor I have. And you're going to be the best writer. And he said, you're going to ghostwrite articles for me. Now, this is when I was on television, local market 20, you know, a million people watching TV. I didn't need another job. <laughs> but he said, you're going to be the best camera editor and the best photographer because I want you to know what your camera crew is going through. I want you to have more empathy. And because of that, I can write a whole chapter on it because I practiced that in every city I was in. But I'm telling you, I tell people all the time, my book is not full of a lot of data. It's not full of a lot of you know, analogies based on the dopamine that comes into your system because you're being kind because you get that runner's high. I don't. I know that's all factual, but I don't go there. I literally tell you how I've lived for the past 15 years. I had to sit down and say, what did I do? I told myself as a kid, I didn't want to be one way on camera and one way off. I wanted to be this way all the time. So I never had to change faces. It was too much energy. So as soon as I sat down to write the book, I really just had to be like, how would I explain this to somebody who doesn't know me and hasn't lived this life? And so that's why the book came about. But again, I didn't know what I was going to write about because it wasn't really my idea. Your career hasn't been just one constant advance through life. You've, you've had some interesting trials and setbacks. Does this persist through that? Yeah, no. It, if it wasn't for this book... And for kindness, what I lived in this book, I don't know that I would be here. I've been able to work in in huge markets. You know, besides New York, I worked in Dallas, Fort Worth for a number of years, and I worked in Los Angeles. And you think that life is just going to be like this progressive stair step. And it's so sweet because when I was in my early 20s, I thought that I was chosen for jobs because I was just good. Like, of course they're going to choose me. Hello. (laughs) And then... Through studying kindness, I realized, no, honey, like there were a lot of good people. Somebody was kind to you, you know, somebody was kind enough to give you a shot. And so I think that for um, me in progressing in my industry, you rely on kindness so much because there's only more people who want your position. Not like they're going to try to take my job, but like that position that I'm going for. 
And so whether I have been on national television or local television or, you know, even my work in speaking and and working out that because getting into the speaking circuit is another challenge altogether in addition to working in a corporate world. That has been a trial, but it has been amazing to see how rapidly kindness has opened doors in my life. And when you've had to do whatever it takes and, you know, um, hustle and take another job if you had to, um, in the meantime, while you're working out your real dream job, it's been because people were kind enough to say, you know what, I remember how kind you were. I remember that you were not somebody who spoke ill of somebody. I'm going to give you a shot again. There were times when you actually left the news business, right? And were working in restaurants. There was one particular time. That was the hardest time of my life. Yeah. That was when a negotiation didn't work out. It was literally like I had nothing. So I had no deal. I had no income. And to go from six-figure income to zero is pretty hard, uh, pretty humbling, And I literally was like, if I don't go to work at a restaurant, I'm not going to be able to eat. I remember going into the restaurant and signing all the paperwork. And it was the day before my birthday and thinking, this is what it's come to. You know, after all these years of working, after all these years of doing what's right and having a great stellar rise, this is what it's come to. And so I I went to work and within, I want to say five days, somebody came in from the business who recognized me. And I sat them at their table and I introduced myself as an industry person. I said, I just want you to know I'm sitting you for lunch, but you're going to start seeing me a lot more. (laughs) And I mean, I was making this like confident presentation, but inside I'm crying I said, you're going to see me a lot more. I just want to let you know. And they said, wow, that's really gutsy. I said, I know. Yes, that's true. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> just out of curiosity, what kind of restaurant is this? Like a sit down, like not white linen tablecloth, but very busy, bustling before the pandemic, obviously. Very cool. The next day or two after that, somebody else walked in who recognized me from the industry. And I introduced myself. I just want to let you know. I wanted to say hello. I hope you enjoyed your meal, but you'll be seeing a lot more of me. And they said, okay, all right. And kind of looked at me puzzled. Why are you telling me all this? But okay, I'm going to be polite. Then the very person who the negotiations didn't work with walked in the restaurant. So this is the person who we were going back and forth. And for whatever reason, the deal fell through. And their name pops up on the computer screen And I thought, what am I going to tell them? They're going to ask, what are you doing here? So I remember going in the coat closet and giving myself a pep talk so that I knew that I didn't look ashamed or fearful that I was working in a restaurant. And they walked in and I had come up with this line that I was going to say, because they were going to say, what are you doing here? And I knew exactly what I would say. So they said it. Their eyes are as big as saucers, like you're seating me, what? (laughs) And I said, well, I'm a host on television and I'm a hostess here. Let me show you to your seat. And um, they looked at me like they saw a ghost. And then out of their mouth, they said, you know, I've been thinking about you. Are you available? Can I, can I call you um, in the next week or so? And I said, absolutely. Enjoy your lunch. And I walked away and I might have cried a little bit in the coat closet. And I just... I remember saying, just because you're doing this does not determine your destiny and your future. And there are plenty of people who've worked in restaurants, you know, in light of their career choices. I mean, you look at all the celebrated actors and theater performers, they do that. Now, I didn't see it the same way because I'm like, what is a journalist doing working in a restaurant? In fact, I had a guy tell me that very thing when I was trying to get a job and I had nothing zero. I went to another place, a burger place. And he says, I've never had this happen. I said, what? He said, I've never had a journalist come and ask me if they could be a waitress. I said, well, it's respectable work. And then I went home and cried. But thankfully it was a very short lived job because after that person came in, I was offered a contract within two weeks. By that person? By that person. That's a great story. That's a terrific story. It's such a wonderful topic for a book at this time for what the country is going through 
Do you have some observations about kindness in the world of the pandemic? I have seen more kindness. You know, when I was just living here in New York, um, the seven o'clock calls, we did it for months. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's since ended. But the whole city would rally at 7 p.m. every night and bang on pots and pans for months. I mean, I'm talking like three and a half, four months. And you looked forward to it. And these are neighbors that you've never met before. But for some part of time, I actually felt like we were all unified in that moment. Somebody who works with me, she had found out that a few of her friends were furloughed because of the economy. Or not furloughed, laid off. They were eliminated. Their positions were eliminated. She called all her mutual friends and said, what are we going to do about it? And they put their money together and funded their groceries for the next month or two while they worked out how they were going to work, you know, again, what their job was going to be. I thought that was one of the sweetest things. That's actually where I got the idea to do virtual meals and virtual coffee. I actually um, mentor another group of women, executive women, and I told them, I said, every month we're going to select a person and we're all going to take her to coffee virtually. And she can do whatever she wants with the money. She can, you know, we'll all put in, you know, five, ten, twenty dollars, whatever you want to put in. And then that person can give it to charity or go get their nails done or take their kids out to get a burger, whatever they want to do. Because for me, everybody is in need of something. Everybody's asking for something. Even if they look like everything's okay and they have a nice house and nice cars and have a good job, there's a level of grieving going on. And that universality of kindness where we're showing it to people no matter what stage of life they're in or what their economic bracket, the kindness of a sweet note, getting mail meant so much more during the pandemic. And so I could give you a whole list of beautiful stories because I post some of those on my Instagram account, The Unbeatable Kind. But it's been those everyday opportunities for kindness that will never get airtime. I love it because when we're all kind to one another, we're all speaking the same language. Well said, well said. All right, so I have some rapid-fire questions for you. Ooh, okay, Frank, let's go. (laughs) What's the one book you wish everyone would read and why? Well, it's interesting. There's a man, and I got this as a referral, named Lou Tice, who wrote a book called Smart Talk. And it's about speaking the right words about your situation and envisioning your situation so that when you walk in, you've already seen it. And I think there's a lack of vision in this world today. It's really helped me to use the power of my imagination to perceive how things can be the way that I want them. So smart talk by Lou Tice. Perfect. All right. What's the craziest good turn someone has done for you? I would say the craziest good turn would probably be the one I talk about in the book when this woman who was, you know, had known me my whole career called up the general manager of the LA station and said, you need to work with Adrian Bankert. I've never heard her say a bad thing about anybody. And the woman hired me on the spot, not because of my resume. In fact, she told me, your resume doesn't have enough on it. But I need more people who are kind and nice in this business. So yeah, I would say that's the craziest good term because it literally was like, you're here. So if there's one person, not a well-known person, but one person that you'd like their name known in the context of kindness, who would that be? I would say a woman named Therese Hardesty, um, but her sister Pam Walton is also there. (laughs) I mean, they have been so kind and helped me when I've been going through stressful things, but also they've helped so many other people and they have a ton of kids. So they've done so much for people while having a lot going on themselves. And both of them volunteer extensively. I think what they've taught me is how you can be a mom, you can be a wife, you can be a volunteer, and you can still make the time to be extremely aware of a stranger or a friend. And just growing that capacity of heart is massive and has given me an example so that when I do expand my family, grow my family, grow my, you know, footprint on this earth that I will be more aware because of their example. So that's their kindness. It's affected me and so many others. Sort of a related question. Who is someone whose behavior you say, I want to model that person's behavior? Oh, well, that would be my mentor. 
like 100%. He, he wrote the foreword of the book, Bill Krause. I've never met anybody so generous and giving um, with, I mean, I call him a generosity coach as much as a life coach. What a great description. Yeah, yeah, generosity coach. Because I think there's an, there's an art to being generous and philanthropic. And giving your life is ultimately what he's taught me. And not letting other people or other things determine his mood and his life. Again, I think I touched on it earlier, but so many people are motivated by pain. And that's how they make decisions for the rest of their life. And I've seen that he's motivated by giving. And uh, that's what I want to be. I want to be motivated by giving. And how did you connect with him? What's the relationship? My former mentor, who I'd known since I was a teenager, I worked in her hair salon, she said, I want you to come to this conference. And I was like, I'm not, no, I'm good. Like, I don't want to go. <laughs> and she's like, no, you have to come. You have to go. This guy's great. And so she invited me and I came. I said, who is this guy? I've never seen somebody who speaks like him, but I want to, I want what he's talking about. And so we met up and I asked him to coach me and now it's been 15 years. He's inspired the book because he said, you know, you should write a book on kindness. When you find somebody who's real and you find somebody who legitimately cares, good people are, I don't, I want to say they're hard to come by, but sometimes they're hidden. And so when you find the real thing, you hold on. That is brilliant. That, that is just brilliant. This has been so fascinating talking with you. I'm one final question. What's the kind of feedback you've gotten from your book or your speeches? Give some examples of that that have been meaningful to you. And you say, gosh, this is achieving what I hoped it would achieve. Like I said, you know, in business, I, I want to be the same person on camera as off. So even when I'm in my apartment and something just comes to me, I feel like there's somebody going through something or... I'm going through something that I'm sure other people are going through too, then I'll share a message online. When I talk about kindness, people have really resonated with it because they want to see proof that they can be kind and strong. I'll have people tell me that they've been told I've been too nice or I'm too nice for this industry. And then they read my book and they say, thank you for showing me that it's not that I'm too nice. It's I'm powerful. It's a choreography. It's a dance. I got a message from a gentleman on LinkedIn, one of the sweetest notes. He said, I'm 47, and I haven't done all the things that I planned on doing by 47. But when I read your book, I realized that I have needed to return to the kind person I was in my 20s. And now my 20-year-old dreams are revived again. Thank you for bringing me back to center. The world is crazy, and I needed to remember the kindness. And that's really what I wanted from this book, because I saw that in life, and it starts younger and younger, disappointments can make us jaded and make us lose hope. And when we lose hope, we start to shrink inside. We start to become unkind. There was another woman who messaged me who saw a video that I was using talking about some of the same tenets from the book. And she said, I was really sad and crying and I didn't want to commit suicide, but I just didn't want to be here. And I thought, what a strong, honest statement that I'm sure a lot of people understand when you're lonely or when things are hard and you don't know how to process your feelings. She said, I saw your video and I stopped crying and you helped me to listen. And I want to thank you for the video. I've had people message me and say how it it gives them a new perspective on relationships. It gives them a new perspective on how we treat each other. It gives them a new perspective on how much they value each other. I tell people that the more you value yourself, the more vision you have. If you don't have vision, you just don't know how important and how worthy you are. And it doesn't make you bad, but my hope was that in telling people that kind was their identity, they would finally have an anchor to their soul. And it it looks as though that people are actually, they're reading, they're listening, and they're understanding at a new level. That's that's just awesome. And we will, by the way, we're going to make sure to buy some of your books to give to our listeners so that- Oh uh, my gosh, that would be so awesome. Thank you. Absolutely will. Um, Where should people go to find out more about you and what- the resources you offer? So they can go to adrianbanker.com, my website. There is a different list of, of courses. We have an e-course for the book that is a totally different set of material than what you read in Your Hidden Superpower. I, I personally went through every single bit of information to make sure that it wasn't just you know, feel good stuff, even though we love feeling good. We like crazy feel good. But... Um, <laughs> But we want, I wanted something that would actually give people more 
empowerment, more tools to living their life at the level that they wanted to. And that's on the HarperCollins Leadership site. But you can find it on adrianbankert.com or you can go to Your Hidden Superpower for a whole list of materials and, and good stuff. And then on my Instagram, The Unbeatable Kind, on Facebook and Instagram, you can also go to AB on TV on Instagram because I got a lot of videos and content there. So yeah, more speaking, more classes, more spreading of kindness is coming. And I'm already writing another book. So I'm excited to give the world more. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Well, Adrian, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing this time with us and our listeners. And I'm sure everybody's, I mean, this has just been a phenomenal thank conversation. You, You're a great conversationalist and thank you for your grace and your kindness and everybody else involved. <laughs> thank you, Adrian. Thank you for listening to this episode. As always, I want to thank Megan Hanlon for the production of this podcast and Stephen Key for his editing and score score in Los Angeles. Thank you, and until next time, this is Frank Blake.